Hello guys and welcome to the IPA Week in Review powered by SSE. How are we guys today? Naku, Monty, have you enjoyed this week's IPL action? Yeah, the IPL keeps on delivering. Um, I thought IPL 2020 was the best uh, tournament so far in terms of tension, but this week has, uh, has set up the tournament very well to beat or match it. Um, what do you reckon, Monty? Have you been enjoying the tournament so far? Yeah, look, I think I think it's been brilliant. You know, uh, one thing we don't see very often in T20 matches is uh, low-scoring contests, and uh, there's been teams which uh, I'm sure there's fans who've probably thought a couple of times of the Mumbai Indians, <laughs> probably thinking, oh, they, you know, this seems like a very strange start for Mumbai Indians, but they still seem to find a way to win, and uh, that's I think what's been the most satisfying, you know. Um, results, you know, low scoring contests. We, we don't see that in other leagues around the world. You know, the IPL always keeps delivering and keeps, uh, you know, entertaining the fans around the world. Yeah, and that brings me to my first point today, actually. I was going to talk about Chennai and chasing in Chennai been difficult. So over the last five, six years, we've been seeing a trend in the IPL where teams win the toss, choose the ball first because chasing has been easy because you can strategize with freaks like AB De Villiers around where you can score 70 runs in the last five. They just tend to chase. But we've seen in Chennai, uh, so far in the six games played there, except the first game, the last five games that have been played in Chennai, the team batting first has won. So let's start by discussing that. Nako, I'll come to you first. Why has chasing in Chennai been difficult in your mind? Moin Morgan said today after the post-match that he was happy to be leaving Chennai because he's not been able to understand the pitch in any of the three games they've played there. So your thoughts? Yeah, well, we have seen the pitches from Chennai from day to day seem to be completely different from each other. Um, and we saw this a little bit in the test series as well. I mean, I know it's completely different, but the, the pitch from the first test, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, to the second test was completely different. Uh, you, completely different styles of pitches rewarded completely different sets of skills. And we've seen that a little bit with, with Chennai today. What I will say, though, of those, of those five chases, three of them should definitely have been won by the chasing team. Regardless of the pitch being difficult, KKR got themselves into a winning position and threw it away. Sunrisers did it twice and threw it away. So I think that we're in danger of building a trend on more limited data than we might like, or we're in danger of missing that nuance and that context. Um, you know, KKR needed what, 30 off 30 with many wickets in hand, didn't make it. Sunrisers needed 25 at not that far much over a runner ball with Abdul Samad uh, and um, I think Vijay Shankar were in and Rashid Khan to come. Definitely should have won. Uh, Sunrise and and there there were other occasions as well where, where actually probably the team uh, Sunrise against RCB should have won uh, definitely that game that Harshal Patel did brilliantly in uh, yeah great performances and fantastic performances by the teams defending those totals but um, I don't I think there's I think the what Morgan says about the unpredictability of the pitch is interesting like today for example was an absolute belter of a track um, and uh, between in the game between RCB and KKR. I think that there's a, a little there's a little bit of a danger of reading too much into these things. Yeah, Monty, uh, you've played at Chepok a few times yourself. I mean, tell us about the pitch. Is it too paced, or do you reckon that it's just the application of the batsman that they've not been able to chase well, or do you think the bowlers have become smarter? Well, I think um, it's uh, it's a combination of like certain teams, you know, at certain venues were able to pick their best eleven, you know. Uh, immediately because it suits their style of pitch. And I think uh, over the past few years, a lot of the IPL teams, because they know uh, home matches are going to be obviously at their own venue, they can, they can start, you know, planning, tailoring, you know, their side for home matches. And, you know, at least they'll, you know, when you're planning to, you know, to be part, to qualify for the playoffs, uh, there'll be a certain percentage where you think, well, at home, you know, we'll, we'll, these are the wins we'll get. But now, because you know, uh, they I think strategically, you know, I think IPL have been very sort of smart about this. They've kind of moved you know teams in 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 in, in different venues, and that what makes it really interesting uh, and for fan engagement for people who like ourselves who you know love talking about the game. Um, that you know, look at KKR. They they haven't really found their best eleven. They're going to go to Mumbai. Um, you know, will will Owen Morgan as a captain able to work out his best eleven? 
you know what I mean? And why is it the likes of Virat Kohli, Rohit Sharma, it doesn't matter where the venue is, whatever the total is, they find a way to win. And I think that's the real skill in the captaincy of T20 cricket, which we've seen in both Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli. And Owen Morgan, actually, as much as we say he's like, oh, greatest T20 captain, I think I'm not sure with that now. You know, I think he's a good captain if he knows the conditions and he knows uh, like the territories and the venues. You put him into an environment like this where, you know, three or four games here, then you've got to pick your best 11 and then whatever the total, defend it. You know, we're all in the same circumstances. I, I just don't think he quite can captain a team as well, uh, like in, in this format. Uh, but coming to that uh, to that point, I would like to say, wouldn't is that Owen Morgan's fault that the batting team, like team batting second, like KKR wasn't able to chase 30 and 30 balls? Surely that cannot be on the captain. No, it's not on the captain, but it, I think it's more to do with the domestic players. You look at every IPL team, look at Mumbai Indians, why they're so successful? Because they've got Kishan and obviously Kamara, you know, the, Kamara Sandiyadeh, if you know, he's, he's a brilliant player, you know, both brilliant young batters coming through the system. They've got the Pandya brothers who play as well. So, you know, it, with the KKR, it's like, you know, you've got, you've got Rana, you've got Shubnam Gill, who's probably the only player, but it's, it feels like, you know, uh, Trapati as well, you know, it feels like there's a lot of responsibility and ownership on the top three to actually set the scene and kind of like get us a good total. Rather, I feel they should break that up and maybe get Owen Morgan to bat at three, you know. And I think as a captain, if you if, if there is a bit of, you know, they've had change of leadership, they're kind of under pressure, you know, they've got to, they've got to perform well because they've got a new captain and, and they've got what they want. So you kind of like, last year was kind of like you thought, well, you know, maybe just <laughs> it's a write-off season. This year we're going to do well. So I think the captain needs to front that up as well and say, right, guys, I'm going to bat at three, you know. And, and really show clear, decisive leadership where I just think even Owen Morgan himself is still trying to find his best 11. Um, and he better start doing that very quickly. You know, in, in Mumbai, he, he must know now what his best 11 is. He's got Harbhajan Singh there, who's very successful in Mumbai, played in Mumbai Indians. And, and effectively, he, he probably is like the, like the vice captain of the team. So, you know, you better you know, start adapting to this new format quickly. Also, with KKR going to soon be you know, we're going to soon going to think they're not, they're not ready for the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, with KKR, Nakul, I wanted your opinion, not just on KKR, but obviously the Chennai pitch, because that's the point of discussion here. Well, Monty mentioned that KKR have not been able to find the best side, but they've not made any changes to the 11 in the three games. And I think that's a sign of Owen Morgan, personally, knowing that this is the 11 he wants to play. With Mumbai, now them moving to Mumbai, which is slightly faster pitch, I would reckon... And I want your opinion on this. Would KKR then drop Shakib, who's not really set the world alight, and pick a Lockie Ferguson at the risk of playing Cummins at seven, which might be one spot too high for him. But also that means KKR attack a lot more. And your thoughts on the Chennai wicket and what you think is actually going wrong. Is it the bowlers becoming smarter or is it just batsmen not applying themselves? We have seen some excellent death bowling from from Mumbai, but uh, and RCB as well. Harsha Patel has been excellent with those slower balls and Yorkers um, and the and the cutters into the wicket as well. Um, and it's not easy to play uh, just read the boomer at any stage of any innings, no matter what the target is. And Bolt has been excellent at the death as well, which is not uh, something he's shown uh, particularly in the past. Um, certainly not to the same level as uh, as just pre the Boomerah. Um, in terms of the pitch, as I say, the pitch seems to be completely different character from match to match. Like today was a completely different pitch from the types of pitches that we've seen uh, in midweek, for example, where it was uh, very much 150 was par pretty much. I mean, today um, RCB got to 204 and, you know, probably par was maybe 180 uh, probably probably today. So uh, I, I'm really not sure how much we can say about the about the pitch. I would like to see Lucky Ferguson come in for Shakib Al Hassan. Ferguson was so good for KKR last year, and he can bowl at any stage of the innings. He can bowl at the death, take some of the pressure off Andre Russell. He can bowl in the middle overs. He can bowl in the power play if you want to bowl the spinners in the middle overs. He gives you that bit of flexibility. And yeah, coming at seven probably is a place too high. I mean, he can obviously he's a decent batter, but I, I do think though, if you're if you're relying on your number seven repeatedly, something's going wrong. And with the power and ability of, Mum, of KKR's top six, 
they shouldn't be in that position too often. You know, it might be helpful getting Andre Russell in a little bit earlier if he's batting at six most of the time. I'm not sure I agree with with Morgan moving up to three. It's not a position he's ever really... He, he, very, he doesn't bat there very often. It's a completely different role for him. He's a brilliant finisher. Yeah, he uh, batted at four today for the first time this season. He's been batting at five or six for KKR throughout this year. So it's like the first time he's come up. Yeah, there. and I... And I completely I understand the the flexibility with Morgan and Karthik and Russell. Um, maybe maybe bring Andre Russell in, in at four and give him a little bit more more time because we know that Dinesh Karthik can certainly go from ball one. We've seen Owen Morgan do it for England as well. So maybe that would be the change. I wouldn't make a change to the top three. I'm I'm always I'm always wary of teams compromising a strength to fix a weakness. The one part of a team in terms of the batting that's definitely working is that top three. And we have seen that consistency, I think, is something that Owen Morgan likes. He likes to know what his plans are. Last year, KKR chopped and changed the top seven all the time. No one knew what their roles were, and it became a real problem for them as they went through the tournament because it's fine to change when something's got, not going right, but then if that doesn't work and you go back to it or you go to something else, now you've tried three plans and none of them have worked. What do you do then? Um, and you, and like, you, that was seven games in. Um, and and then you're then you're really in trouble. Um, so I don't think so. I would like to see that that change. And and you back your very talented top six to to do better. Yeah, and of course, with them moving to Mumbai, we'll see what changes they make. I think it'll be maybe one, but I don't think he'll change the team much personally. But moving on from KKR, you mentioned a few bowlers, and that brings me to the second part of this discussion, which is the fast bowlers dominating the IPL wickets column this season. Uh, the purple cap listings out of the top 10 so far, only two of them are spinners, which is Rahul Chahar and Rashid Khan. No surprises with Rashid Khan there. And the rest eight of them are all fast bowlers. And Nakul, you mentioned Trent Bolt, Jaspreet Bumra, Harshal Patel, who now holds the purple cap, being all very smart in the death. How much has fast bowling evolved since 2008 in the first season, in the first game of the IPL when we saw Brendan McCullum smack 158 not out, and we thought, wait, does would anyone ever want to become a bowler after watching this? England had a five-year advantage on this uh, on this plan with the two, with the two, two the blast in. Uh, it wasn't called the blast then; it was called the 2020 Cup in 2003. I mean, Monty, you'll know this. Uh, you were coming up through domestic cricket at the time. Everyone thought who'd want to be a bowler in T20, and especially who'd want to be a spinner in T20. And actually, it turns out spinners are good. Uh, taking spinners are gold dust in T20. But a lot of teams, most T20 leagues around the world, the team with the best bowling attack or the best balanced bowling attack will, will be very, very hard to beat. We saw it with the Perth Scorchers uh, in, in the Big Bash. We see it with Mumbai, uh, where they had uh, Bumrah and Malinga, and last year Bumrah and Bolt. Uh, and we see it with, with uh, Trinbago in the CPL. Uh, and not to an extent in the, in the T20 Blast. I mean, they do have a powerful batting lineup as well. Um, and Essex as well, uh, but uh, but they also have excellent uh, bowlers like Harry Gurney, uh, very experienced, very clever bowlers who know exactly what they're doing. Score, you can't put yourself in a situation where you need to score 200 all the time. And the evolution of skill, uh, yeah, you would be the IPL wouldn't have lasted this long, frankly, if bowlers hadn't evolved in the uh, in what, the 14 years of uh, of the IPL. And, and we do see. Um, we see the, not so much the skills per se, but what I think is that we're seeing, guys like Harshal Patel, who is nowhere near the Indian team. I think even if he has a really good IPL, he probably won't be near the Indian team. Um, Avesh Khan, who's nowhere near the Indian team. Ashdeep Singh, nowhere near the Indian team, probably isn't likely to be. Deepak Chahar has only just broken into the Indian team. The depth of, uh, of that learning and the, the fact that bowlers at all levels have those skills, I think is a good is a very good sign for the uh, for the development of T twenty fast bowling. Um, but like, I mean, uh, Monty, I mean, like, what was the you know the interesting question about what was the sort of evolution of uh, when did bowlers realise that actually we can be a weapon and a threat in T twenty rather than just trying to survive. I think it was, you know, death bowling, to be honest, you know, at the death overs, they realized that, I, you know, first couple of overs in the power play, they may go for like, let's say two for 20 or two for 30. 
you know, if they've had a real bad day, and then they pull it back. You know, they get a couple of wickets in the death, and they, and even uh, you know, uh, during during my county stints, like it was just gold dust for someone who could, you know, just bowl Yorkers and be a brilliant death bowler. There was just a specialist skill of bowling at in the death overs, and and th- and that's what you can see with the likes of you know Mumbai Indians, even Delhi Capitals. You know, they're two probably the strongest sides, and any team that is chasing their total down. They need to effectively think that we've got to like do it in 19 overs, you know, effectively, because after the 15th over, they've got to be ahead of the rate. And once they're ahead of the rate, just be Brahma, Trembot will come in, and that's where they pull the game back. And that's why it makes it a lot easier for Rohit Sharma to like, you know, con- continually win because he knows he's got great death bowlers. But for Virat Kohli, you know, this is like a new territory for him. He's like, wow, you know, even today, he was brilliant with his captaincy. And, and he feeds off A.B. de Villiers' energy when he just plays unbelievable. Like today, you know, how good was he? You know, it was like 360. But for, you know, expert, you know, analysts like ourselves, it was like, wow, we've got to celebrate. You know, this is probably once in a century sort of, you know, sportsman. And it was just unbelievable uh, batting. Um, what, what do you make of his uh, batting today, Nicole? Well, I mean, uh, this is, this ties actually nicely into the death bowling because we saw Andre Russell's been really good this year bowling round the wicket, very wide of the crease. And I was really, I was really looking forward to this challenge of De Villiers, someone who has a much wider range of stroke than anyone else in the world, and De Villiers was astonishing today when he, Russell bowls those two wide Yorkers. First one, I think, was the best of the lot, where he opens the fe- bat face at the last minute gets himself into a perfect position and smashes the ball over point for six. And then the next ball, uh, he has to, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit closer to him. He has to lever his body out of the way, get the full face of the bat on it and guide it past third man for four. And Russell, and then Russell loses it, lost his line and lost his length and started bowling, uh, um, on his pads, and that's exactly where De Villiers wants it. But he made him do that by the fact that he took away the option, which has basically been like a cheat code for Russell, bowling that very wide of the crease and round the wicket. So I thought it was a brilliant bit of targeted tactical batting from A.B. A. De Villiers. And very think- good players have the skill to do that uh, yeah. as consistently as he had. We saw, we saw, we've seen other people try it, but... Um, but when you're bowling to De Villiers, you have to be absolutely perfect. But we also have to keep in mind that De Villiers is a freak, right? That he he can do things not many other cricketers can, and which is why what Monty said. Yeah, but Viraj, but don't you think uh, Owen Morgan had a bad day in captaincy today? Oh yeah, eighteenth, nineteenth. He brings Harper and Singh on an off spinner. Went went for eighteen. He could have easily brought on Sakawal Busan, the left arm spinner. But I think what happened that well, he tried to bowl the, the other seamers out early to try and get a wicket, which was completely fine. I had no problem with that. Um, and I think it probably had to happen, to be honest, um, because they had to get Maxwell and De Villiers out at that point. Should have a word for Glenn Maxwell, by the way, who also batted brilliantly coming in after that loss of early wickets. Um, and was even more impressive by the fact that Dave Duck Padakal was so lacking fluency at the other end. Um, but yeah, I think Morgan... I'm not sure I agree that he had a bad day. I think he stuck, he stuck to his plan and it didn't work. Yeah, but I don't want to... Sp- speak too much about the KKR game because, I mean, our discussions more suit uh, to talk about the fast bowlers. Well, I would like to talk in today's game, though, is Siraj bowling the 19th over. He's come a long way from 2019 when he was getting hit all over the park and there were memes about him. I've watched interviews where he said it kind of hurt him. It was, made him upset because he himself was learning the game at that point. He'd just broken into IPL. It was new and he was like, I've worked hard to get here. And then you just suddenly become a meme, which is what we saw happen to Prithvi Shaw last year as well. But you know, Siraj has come a long way and he's worked with the bowling, uh, the coaching department at RCB as well as with India to improve his skills. What's clicked for him as well as Harshal Patel, who's been around the IPL circuit a while, hasn't really made too much of an impact, was traded in by RCB as a specialist death bowler because that's where they identified they were struggling last year. What have th- those two done correctly this year, which has helped RCB remain the only unbeaten team so far? Well, I think, yeah, one, one of the reasons you know, RCB has remained unbeaten, it's actually the courage that Virat Kohli has sought. He's, he knew that if I keep batting uh, in you know, m- you know, the same positions that I have been in for the RCB, 
and you know enjoy batting with Amy Davilias, you know, get myself you know batting together, but we're not really winning. Like, you know, and he took he took himself out of his comfort zone. He said, right, I'm going to open the batting, you know, and I'm going to take charge. I'm going to, you know, it makes a huge difference when the captain takes the front seat and says, right, I'm going to lead from the front. And that's what Virat Kohli is doing. And it makes a huge difference, you know, to the RCB performances. It, it gives confidence to everyone else. It's that clear, you know, um, decision making. It's that being decisive under pressure, which Virat Kohli does by saying, I'm going to open the bat in, guys, and we're going to change something up. And I'm going to do that. And we're going to, you know, through that, it's helped clarity for the rest of the side. And you look at the other side, obviously, Nickel disagrees with me with <laughs> Owen Morgan not going up the order. If Owen Morgan shows that sort of ascendancy, right, guys, you know, we've changed the captaincy. I'm the captain. I'm not going to sit behind. I'm going to be the guy at number three. I'm going to bat. If we lose a few wickets, then you guys, the whole team bats around me. And then at the end, I'll, you know, hit a few sixes and fours. And if we start, if we, if we start off really well, then I'll continue with that. This is the problem KKR are having. They don't have a batsman they can bat around with. But with Virat Kohli this year, you can see he, he is batting slightly longer, but he may not hit the boundaries and the sixes and the fours he wants to, but he's changing his role because he knows the other batsmen. He allows the likes of Maxwell to fulfill, you know, Virat Kohli's role. And then AB, yeah, yeah he just, you know, keeps performing like he does. So this is, it, it's a finding a way to win matches. And I think this is what's special about Virat Kohli this year. I think on the, on the, on the point of Harshal and, and, and Siraj, uh, Siraj has gained a huge amount more confidence, but it doesn't always translate across formats. Um, you know, I think Mohammed, I think Mohammed Shami is a really good example. Mohammed Shami is a brilliant Test bowler and can be very useful in a one-day international as well in certain circumstances. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, Mohammed uh, Mohammed Shami in England later this later this summer. I think he's a fantastic red ball bowler, but he's never been an elite T20 bowler. Um, I probably never is going to be an elite T20 bowler. Certainly not at the same level. Um, and Sirad probably, I think, is again, well, probably is probably a better list day bowl. Uh, sorry, first class bowler. His first class numbers are great um, in, in the Runji Trophy for India A. Uh, and he may never be quite an elite T20 bowler, but he's finding a he's finding a role and he's finding um, finding a way to be successful. And you're completely right in the in the you know a couple of years ago, I was looking at the, the numbers in 2019. He went up to nine and a half and over over the course of the tournament, um, taking less than a wicket a match. Um, you know, last year was a little bit better. And, and so far this year, it's only three games, but he's going under a run of ball. Considering that he bowls in the power play and at the death, that's unbelievable. And he had a clear plan going into that 19th over. Excuse me. And that's so important. Siraj, he, his thing, he's saying when he, you can, I think you can tell a lot about a bowler, about what they do when they get hit. Uh, I used to say that Shane Warne says this about spinners. Um, you know, really brave spinners toss the ne- try and turn the next ball more if they get hit. I know that doesn't quite work necessarily in T20 cricket, but I think it's a nice little... Uh, but they back themselves to do it, but better. Uh, Mohamed Siraj's plan was bowl wide Yorkers to Andre Russell. He set the field. He bowled the highest percentage delivery. Russell can make anyone look ridiculous. He can make any, any boundary look tiny, but he wasn't going to be deterred from that. Russell made it a little bit easier for him, I think, by it may be not going quite deep in the crease enough, or, you know, there's maybe little tactical things that Russell, or technical things that Russell can uh, can can work on. Uh, I saw a little bit of analysis that he isn't quite clearing his front leg as much as he did um, last year, maybe, um, and, and, and the year before. We'll, we'll want to have a bigger sample size on that. But his, uh, his the, the thing that Monty talked about in terms of clarity of planning, clarity of roles, and having the confidence to say, right, this is my plan, set the field accordingly. Um, and I think that's really important. And Harshal Patel's, um, sometimes it just, it takes a few years for it to click. Um, it, it, all of those skills that people have been working on click. And he's getting, he's getting his slow balls to swing and dip in the air, and it's really difficult to pick up. You know, someone will, will get after him at some point, as, as happens with all, with everyone. And this is, the, this is one of the great things about cricket, and T20 is a very accelerated version of this, is that somebody comes up with a new skill or a new tactic or... Um, the analysts go do their work and decide, right, this is how you bowl to this guy. That guy's now they've got to adapt. Or, or this, let's, let's, in, in the spirit of this week, let's not use, let's use gender neutral language. This batter's now got to adapt. Uh, or um, this batter does this brilliantly, so this bowler's got to adapt. 
uh, you've got to set your fields accordingly, depending on uh, depending on where a batter hits. And this kind of arms race of talent, it just and, and ability and uh, and execution just keeps going and going and going. Um, and some players, the great players, adapt all the time. Um, like no one has ever found a way to bowl consistently at the death to AB de Villiers. No one. And this is for fifteen years. No one has no one has has done this. Um, and I know he's a freak. And you're right. And not everyone can reach that level. But that's the uh, but that level of adaptability uh, is incredible. And uh, Mohammed Siraj has shown a little bit of that. He's shown a little bit of that same spirit of uh, of being able to adapt and to uh, and to find a way to be effective. Yeah, and last... well, he did. Well, he didn't didn't adapt today, did he, Mohammed Siraj? <laughs> Yeah. He was bowling full tosses, poor fella. I felt sorry for him today. He had a, a terrible day. He uh, gave a couple of free hits and that was game over. You're thinking Mohammed Shami. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Mohammed Shami there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, 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 less, the less said about the Punjab bowling, the, uh, the better, really. Yeah. I felt quite sorry for Riley Meredith when he was being uh, uh, taken to task by Shikhar uh, It was a stunning innings from, for yeah. Shikhar I mean, Punjab look a mess with their bowling, frankly. Yeah, I think uh, we'll talk about Punjab in just a bit. But the last two people in this segment about the fast bowlers I wanted to talk about was Jaydev Bunatkar and Deepak Chahar. Jaydev Bunatkar coming back into the side, went for four overs, 15 runs, three wickets against Delhi Capitals and bowled really well. And he spoke about settling down and, you know, knowing his role in the side. And that helped his clarity of thought when he was bowling. And Deepak Chahar, who went for four overs, 40 plus runs in the first game, came back and like, Four overs, 13 runs, four wickets against Punjab Kings. So, both those bowlers, like you said earlier, Deepak Chahar just breaking into the Indian side. Jaydev Bunatkar has played for India, but never really made an impact as he has done in the IPL. But what did those two players also do right in the games they played well in? I like the way that Rajasthan are using Anadkar this year. For years, he has been... Because he had that amazing season for Pune, for the Rising Pune Supergiant in 2017, where he was bowling very well at the death. Since then, he's not had much success as a death bowler. In fact, he's, I, this is the first year since that season that he's not been released and bought back for less money uh, by, by Rajasthan. Uh, and he's been steadily declining. This time, they decided to use him up front in the power play. He bowled his slow balls, his dipping slow balls, yes, but he's primarily a pitch it up and move it bowler. He swings the ball back into the right-hander, uh, almost bowling like he does in first-class cricket, where actually he's been very successful. You know, possibly had he come through a couple of years later, he might now be in this group of, of fast bowlers alongside Siraj and Saini and uh, and guys who are challenging uh, who are challenging for the Indian Test team. And I think probably he's another one who actually that year slightly masked the fact that he's a better first class bowler than he is a T20 bowler. Uh, but but I like the usage of him. I prefer the usage of him in the power play, finishing him out in the middle overs, um, not having him bowl at the death. Um, and that, those roles are important, and that clarity of role is, is important. Like someone can be very good in one stage and not, not in another. Um, and I think the the usage of him was very good. Uh, Deepak Chahar, we know, is a brilliant opening bowler. He's added little bits of it. He can bowl. He can be more effective in the middle and the death overs. But he is primarily uh, he is primarily someone who uses who bowls in the power play. I think it was 2019 that he the first six seven games, every single every single game he bowled his four straight through at the top. And it was a big part of why Chen and I were, were very good in the, uh, in, the in 2018 and 19, getting winning and then getting to the final. Uh, and I think if they can get that back, that's a massive part of the, the job done for them. So now we're going to talk about game changers this week. And I've got some stats here, thanks to our friends at SSE. Uh, they've given us some numbers about how their game impacted the match. So... You go check out their website where you can buy players and the price changes according to their impact in the game. And so I've got the game changes for this week, the biggest game changers. Rahul Chahar features twice, so I'll start with him first. The Mumbai Indians versus Sunrisers Hyderabad game. He had a 13 points price rise because he bowled four overs, three wickets for 19 runs. And the other time was four overs, four wickets for 27 runs where he had an 18 point price rise against the Kolkata Knight Riders. So let's start with you, Monte. From a spinner's perspective, what is Rahul Chahar doing right? And has he booked himself a plane ticket to go for the World Cup with the Indian squad? Well, I think that's a bit far-fetched if you ask me, you know, uh, to get into the T20 squad. But I think what he's doing right is that um, he's able to um, read the batsman. 
And that's something that uh, young spinners find very difficult to do. He's reading the batsman, he's bowling accordingly, the right length to them. And, and, and he has the courage to actually give the air, um, especially to the new batters who are just coming in. You know, normally you look for the quick dot balls and get out of the over, but he's, he's really looking to get wickets. And it's, it's just a mindset, it's an attitude that he has, which is, you know, really impressive. You know, I, I think someone like you got, you know, absolutely <laughs> during the T20 against England, he was just like getting hit out of the ground by uh, Ben Stokes. And, and to show the, 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 still the courage to keep giving it air and, and do that, it's, it, it just shows, you know, like someone like Rohit Sharma understands the game. He understands, you know, what is required to keep youngsters in an attacking frame of mind. And, and this is a prime example of having a great leader and bringing the youngsters through, you know. Under Rohit Sharma's captaincy, how many of the young Indian players have come through and played for India? You know, and, and, and this is, that's the reason. Because Rohit Sharma is just brilliant at helping these younger players to, to, to have an attacking mindset. Yeah, uh, Nako, why don't you tell us, uh, continue with the thought that Monty had about Rohit Sharma as well as what Rahul Chahar has done right this week. Yeah, it's amazing to think that Rahul Chahar is still only 21 years old. And he's been uh, a regular in the most successful IPL team of all time for the last three years. Uh, he played uh, almost every game in, in 2019 and 2020 um, as basically their lead spinner slash at times their only spinner. Mumbai haven't had a genuinely world-class spinner probably since Harbhajan left. And even then, I mean, he was towards the... Uh, probably, he was certainly nowhere near his peak, uh, Harbhajan, as a, as a bowler then. And they've not needed one. They've not needed to go and spend a lot of money on a big-name established spinner because Rahul, Rahul Chahed has been excellent. Uh, you know, he started as a leg spinner who bowled very quick with a very quick arm and had a good googly. But I think he's really adapted very well to this Chennai pitch, which is completely different from the Wankade pitch they normally play on. And I think we saw this a little bit in the UAE last year where he, he's enjoying the fact he can bowl a little bit slower through the air. Excuse me. He can, he's enjoying the fact that he can actually get the ball to turn a little bit. Um, I was a little bit worried going into the tournament about Mumbai playing a lot of games on slower pitches this year. I think it's nine of their games are either Chennai or Delhi. Uh, pitches that are slower, pitches that do turn a little bit where uh, a very good spinner can be very dangerous uh, for you. And Mumbai, as I say, don't have a truly elite spinner, but Rahul Chahar is uh, finding a way to perform again. And uh, as Monty says, that confidence to, uh, to bowl a little bit slower, to vary his flight a little bit more, to try and turn the ball, to try and be an attacking weapon rather than just, you know, rather than only getting through your four overs at a runner ball, which obviously is, which has its value massively. And I'm not denying how difficult that is in, in T20 cricket. I mean, Rashid Khan basically is the only one who can do that consistently. But, but Rahul Chahed is a, has become a massive weapon and a massive part of this as Mumbai team. I know he did find himself out of the tournament towards the end of last year, but I think that was just a matchup thing. But now I think if they wanted to bring in Giant Yadav, they would bring him in for someone else. They would bring him in for maybe Marco Janssen, or they would bring him in for, uh, um, for they would they would change the team in another way, uh, rather than leaving out Rahul Chahed as the as the first option. And that's massive testament to him uh, and the work that he has done alongside. And and yes, the cap the confidence of given to him by the fact he's in a winning team. He knows his role in this team with this ethos set. Uh, with Mahela at the top, with Rohit Sharma, with Kyron Pollard. Mahela's won a, a World Cup with, with Sri Lanka, a World T20. Uh, Rohit Sharma and Kyron Pollard have won everything all around the world in T20 cricket. Um, and, and that having, once you have earned their trust, um, and you, it, gives you, it must give you a massive amount of confidence uh, to, to know that you, you are, that you are backed by them uh, and that um, and that your role is important, and and Rahul Chahar is massively thriving as a result. Yeah, and lastly, Nako, do you think with the, obviously Kuldeep been struggling? He's not played in the IPL this year. Probably won't go in the World Cup squad. Ashwin's not been. People been clamoring for Ashwin to break back into the Indian team. He hasn't been setting the world alight this IPL either. And Yuzvendra Chahal just took his first two wickets today. In your opinion, should Rahul Chahar be on that team for the World Cup, at least in the squad? 
I think he's in the conversation. I, mean, I think unless they expand the... I have seen that they might have bigger squads for the World T20 I, I think they're planning to do it around 23 members, I believe. Right. If it's a 23-person squad, then yes, I think he will play. I think India's first-choice spinners in T20 cricket are still Chehel, uh, Ravindra Jadeja, and uh, Washington Sundar. Uh, I think that, that those seem to be the main three that they're, they're going with. Uh, Rahul Jahed can't bat, so, so he loses out in that regard. Um, Kral Pandya, I think, might be in that conversation as well as kind of the, as the backup spinners. Um, so in an expanded squad, yes, I think Rahul Jahed has a very good chance. I would love to see Kuldeep have a good IPL. I really would. I love watching him bowl. Um, and maybe uh, when, uh, and maybe later in the tournament, uh, KKR might find a way to get him back into the team and he can, uh, he can thrive. But I think uh, at the moment, I don't think Rahul Chahar is, is going to be making India's first choice 11, but I think in an expanded squad, um, he's certainly doing enough. Yeah, and moving on from the spinner to another Indian player who set the world alight this week with his IPL performance is Shikhar Dhawan, now the proud holder of the orange cap. Got 92 today, and I'll just reel off his game-changing moment. 13-point price rise, 92 runs from 49 balls, and helped Delhi Capitals beat the Punjab Kings today. He's been getting 90s, quite a few 80s, 90s, but not being able to get that 100. Would he be concerned, Nako? He got 200s in two games last year. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, to be honest... <sighs> He, he is not a player who strikes. I know he actually does have a very good record at scoring big hundreds, uh, particularly in ICC tournaments. But, um, excuse me, uh, he, he got out playing an attacking stroke that was going to help his team if it came off uh, today. And that uh, Risha Punt is very much a captain who would want that. I think I, I, how much emphasis he can put on a team at this stage. But I don't think, for example, and Monty's talked a lot about the influence of Ricky Ponting. I don't think Ricky Ponting would want a player scratching around or changing their game to try and get a milestone. And I don't think, it, I don't think it's of much value to, to him or to the team. But uh, Shekhar Dhawan has been sublime in the IPL for, for, a num- for a number of years now. Think of that last season at Sunrisers, where he was batting with David Warner, moving to, this, to the Delhi Capitals team, which was struggling when he, when he came into the, into the team. But he's formed a brilliant partnership with, with Prithvi Shaw. And I thought the way that he was able to absorb the fact that Stephen Smith was batting so badly at the other end was really impressive uh, today. Uh, and the fact that um, his unflappability and the fact that he seems to have such calmness and clarity. And you see it in the field that he's under these, he's taken what, seven catches in three games now? And a lot of them have been skiers that have gone a long way up in the air and, and have swirled around all over the place. And he's just calm as anything underneath him. Uh, you know, he goes up in the air. He goes up in the air. You, Arisha Bhogle going... He'll have he'll have a bruise in his inner thigh if he keeps clapping in the heart. I was gonna say you go up, you go the ball goes up in the air to Shekhar Dhawan and you think right there's a five five coming. Uh, so yes, Shekhar Dhawan was sublime today. As I said, I think I said this earlier. Um, just his he looked like the you couldn't bowl at him uh, today, Shekhar Dhawan. Yeah, and Monty on the Shekhar note, we saw in the T Twenty series against England. Uh, they opened with KL Rahul and Rohit Sharma. And then when that didn't work, Ishan Kishan opened in one of the games. And then we saw Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma opening in the last one. But, and then Shikhar Dhawan obviously opened in the ODIs and did well. But would you, if he keeps batting like this and wins the orange cap, would he then be your first choice opener alongside Rohit Sharma and Kohli can bat at three? Or would you think he's, it's, it's time to move on from that Shikhar Dhawan and Rohit Sharma combination? Well, um, I think um, for any youngsters, you know, watching the, this IPL, um, uh, it's, there, there's always like, you know, optimism thinking that, oh, you know, T20 cricket is for the youth, you know, it's for the people who, who um, you know, play, you know, T20 cricket. But I think um, with Shrekar Ravan, um, the tendency is to look too far ahead, you know. He's only had a couple of good games. Um, and even for him to win the Orange Cap, does it guarantee that place? It's very difficult to say because there's a lot. There'll be other, you know, players you know, performing in the IPL. And when it comes to selecting a team and a squad, it's about Virat Kohli will only pick players where he'll think which are the best eleven that will make us win the team. You know, we've got to win. That's what it's about. Now, who is our best eleven for that? 
And Shekhar Dhawan may be great for Delhi Capitals. He may, he may get the Orange Cup, he may you know, score loads of runs. But does he feature in an Indian T20 team where the whole, all the 11 players will help to win? You know, that's what it's about. And it was still too far. You know, I can't answer that question. You know, um, I think maybe at the, you know, once we're three quarters into the, into the tournament, then maybe I can give you a, a, a better answer. As far as we know at this stage, Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma are India's, are India's go-to. Um, as far as we know at this stage, but, you know, Monty's right, there's a hell of a lot of cricket to be played <laughs> between now and then. I mean, there's a whole summer after the IPL as well, remember? Um, um, for this, but I, I didn't think I, the one thing on this. Uh, you, we mentioned a couple of times, and it's inevitable, I suppose, that we someone has someone performs well in the IPL, and it's sudden. It's always seen in light of pushing ahead for national selection. It's a good thing, and it's a valuable thing in itself to have a good IPL because this is a competition you're trying to win, and uh, this is something that enhances your reputation. Uh, and uh, it's not of less value, for example, if Shikhar Dhawan or I don't know who else it might be, Rahul Chahed or uh, or Avesh Khan has a really good IPL and then doesn't make the India squad. That doesn't mean it was wasted. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, because they're not making the India team, they're suddenly not good players. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, when you pick an international squad, you don't just select on who the guys who are, have just scored runs in the last, like, three, four games or even the last half season. It doesn't work like that. Um India have an idea of how they want to play. And I think they found that model really well with Kohli opening, get, seems to get the best use out of, uh, of him, given the power that India have through the rest of the order. Um, you know, already Shreyas Iyer is, probably, is possibly struggling to get back into the white ball teams because he bats in a similar way to Virat Kohli. Uh, and because you have the power of Surya Kumar Yadav, Ishan Kishan, and, the Pund- and uh, Hardik Pandya, Risha Pant. This is an entire middle order of players who can score at a much faster rate. Shikhar Dhawan, even at his best, you know, this, I say at his best, scoring only nine and over uh, is, uh, is impressive. But, um, but I, uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, unless Rohit gets injured, and even then, probably KL Rahul is is probably next off the next cap off the rank. Um, I I'm a little bit worried about KL Rahul to be honest. I think today was a slightly worrying innings. Um, if you're looking from the outside, I think the um, he's rever- he reverted back to type from last year of being very cautious in the middle part of the innings and really slowing down after a good start. And I don't think that helps him or Punjab. I mean, they left 15 runs out there today. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot with the batting. And the last person, just before we end, not long, but a quick word on Sanju Samson's 100, the first 100 of this year's IPL. Magnificent innings. And he said in one of the second the one after Chris Morris won them the last game, that if he had that moment 100 times over, he still wouldn't take the single. Which is good from him, I feel, anyway, that he sh- he's showing the confidence that he backed himself at that moment because he was batting well to hit those runs himself and not leave it on the other man. But I'll come to you first, Monty. Uh, what, what did you think of his innings? And was it the right decision to not take the run? Well, I think Sanju Samsung is one of them sort of players where um, you just, he kind of like lost himself, you know, out of the limelight really since the emergence of Rishan Pant. And uh, sometimes that can happen in sport, you know, when you're playing in team environments where, um, you know, other players like the likes of Richard Pant and I'm sure there's other, you know, players will come through the ranks and, and, and you're kind of forgotten. And it's good to see the likes of, you know, um, Kumar Sangakara trying to find ways to bring Sanju Samson, you know, back into light, you know, like reignite him. And, and I think the leadership is well, was part of that process to say, right, you know, you're not going to hide behind. You know, his personality is quite sort of, you know, timid sort of person. So give you the leadership, captain from the front. And uh, in a way, it's, it's worked for him, you know, and, uh, and, and, he, and he's batted really well. Um, yeah, look, sometimes people talk about in T20 cricket, oh, he was selfless, he's a selfless person, you know, not getting his 100 or X, Y and Z. That, that's, the milestone isn't the key. It's more about bringing 
Sam Jude Sumson playing at his best again. You know, that's far more important to see. And actually, it, it, it was great to see that such a supreme talented cricketer is able to play like he's playing. And now the next step for him would be now as a leader and as you know, leader of, of, of Rajasthan Royals is can we actually now build a team where without Ben Stokes there and make it to the playoffs? You know, now that would be great for him because he can actually, he's a direct competition for, you know, Richard Punt, knowing that, well, I can't, you know, wrestle on my laurels and, you know, I have just, you know, everyone's saying I'm box office. I don't keep performing a few more games and suddenly there'll be Sanju Samson there. So that's how I think Sanju Samson's got a great opportunity, you know. This, this could really help him, this IPL, uh, to, to, to narrow that gap um, with Rishan Pan. Yeah, Nako, and your thoughts on the Sanju Samson innings? We've seen Sanju Samson batting like this before and it's glorious. He's, when he's batting well, he's an absolute delight to watch. He has this such an easy, fluid swing of the bat. He can hit the ball a really long way with, and he doesn't appear to be, it's not that he doesn't, he's not going to hit hard because he is, but the bat swing is so smooth. Um, and it really is, it's absolutely delightful to watch him. He goes o- over the offside, over, over off uh, fast bowlers, over cover. He hits the spinners back over their heads. He pulls well. Um, the one thing that he hasn't done is really dominate a whole series of an IPL year. I think it's the last three seasons or last two seasons, he's scored a hundred in the first game of the tournament and then uh, and then faded as Rajasthan has faded as well. So I mean that will be important. Um I I think the fact that he um I think it'll be really interesting to see him and Butler batting together for a long time. I think that's gonna be a, a joy. And uh, Monty's right about the leadership challenge in the in that sense. This is a weirdly put together team for Rajasthan Royals, particularly now with Stokes absent. And staying competitive long enough for Archer to make a difference is is what it's about for Rajasthan here. If they can stay in the middle of the pack, uh, you know, slightly more wins than losses, and stay competitive until Archer's fit again, um, you know, Jopper Archer is someone who can win you games by himself. Uh, and that uh, staying staying competitive for long enough and getting our Rajasthan into the playoffs would be a huge achievement. I don't know if it's enough to get him back into the Indian team. It almost doesn't matter, um, to be honest. Um, I personally think Rachel Pant should should have that slot in all formats um, because I think his because I think he's a, a, an astonishing player, uh, truly. Uh, and I think Sanju Samson is, you know, a very small step below that. Uh, but we're setting a very high bar for ourselves at this at this point. You know, it would be great to find a way to get them both into the same team, but I don't know if that, how that happens either. Um, but but all Sanju Samson can do is keep performing. Uh, you know, it sounds such a cliche, but that's all he can do and, and see what happens. And it's, as I said earlier, it's a good thing in and of itself. And it would be a huge achievement to get this Rajasthan Royals team into the playoffs. Yeah, and obviously, again, with passing time, we'll know a lot more if Sanju Samson can capitalize on this start this season. To end with, I would quote Harsha Bogle's tweet on Sanju Samson. When Sanju Samson scores 25, it is a melody. This century is a symphony, an absolute treat to watch from one of the most gifted players around. And I think that's the words we should end it on because nobody says it better than Harsha Bogle in my mind. So thank you both for joining me for this week's IPL review. And hopefully I'm more perky and positive next week with more wins for KKR because it doesn't seem like it's going for us in any manner right now. But thank you both for joining me. I really appreciate your time and I'll see you soon.